Greetings, beloved, and thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to present to you today some of our wonderful ministers who will share the seven last words today. You're in the right place at the right time. God has a great blessing in store for you. It's the Easter season. And listen, you have to mark your calendar. Come out and share with us on Easter Sunday morning. We're going to be in the parking lot. You'll be able to sit in your car. You'll be able to sit in chairs outside in the parking lot. 8 and 1045. It's going to be a wonderful time. Oh, by the way, I thought I, I didn't induce myself. I'm Pastor Kimbrough from Mount Carmel, and what a wonderful, wonderful season we're in. So now I want you to receive our ministers as they come to us, each sharing as the Lord has blessed them. Thank you. And again, thank you for joining us here at Mount Carmel. victorious today. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, saints, give him the highest praise.
Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Say that with me, if you will. Say his name, Jesus. Because just the mention of his name brings a sort of elated feeling and spiritual uplift to our very souls. Amen. All of you who know you have been redeemed by his shed blood, just say amen and thank you, Jesus. Let's look back at how all of this was accomplished. Luke 23 and 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. See Jesus now after having been marched from judgment hall to judgment hall, being abused, spit on in his face, beaten with a whip called the cat of nine lives, a crown of thorns placed on his head and he was beaten some more, given a non-deserved guilty sentence with the punishment of death by crucifixion. They put a rugged cross on his shoulder, made him carry his own instrument of punishment to a hill called Golgotha, sort of like your mama used to tell you to go in the backyard and get that switch that she was going to whip you with. Now, you may have been guilty, but Jesus was not. They whipped him up that hill. Jesus stumbled and fell down. They beat him until he got back up. And now he's almost at the place where they would take his life. And he stumbles again. Look at him. He receives help from one Simon coming from the countryside of Cyrene in Africa. And all of this is taking place on the continent of Africa. Simon came and helped Jesus to bear that cross. And once there, they nailed him to the cross that he carried and bore for you and me and all of humanity. He's now secured to that cross by nails that were rusty and sharp that caused bleeding to occur at the nailed places at both his hands and his feet. These nails held him in place, but love kept him there. While those below the cross waited for him to die, gambling for his clothes, just as the Old Testament scripture told us would happen. An innocent dying for the guilty. A loving God dying for the hateful. A kind person dying for the evil. Look at him as he hangs from that cross observing all of his haters below and a few that loved him, his mama, aunties, cousins, and them. But he's willingly given up his life for all of humankind because we do know that he could have called 10,000 legions of angels to come and to help him and fight for him, to take out his haters. Amen? But no, he stayed there so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins and our wrongs and more, not have to pay the deserved consequence of the same. His disciples are long gone, not wanting to be around him in this his most desperate hour. They all deserted him and ran away. Yet his love for them and all of mankind remained as he suffered. Look at him, being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes, we are healed of the penalty for our iniquities and for our sins. Loving all, but being deserted, 
by friend and foe. Now all he has left to do is to call on his father. And he cries out to him in a loud and audible voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And that statement demonstrates his love for us when others would hate us for this evil deed. How many times has Jesus had to say to the Father, for you saints, Father, forgive him or her for their sin against you and me. How many times have we put Jesus back on that cross by our disobedience and against him? For each time we sin against him, it is as if we are crucifying him afresh. How many times has he had to cry out to his father as he sits now at his right hand, making intercession for us? Father, forgive them because I died for their healing and for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And how they make us weep each time when we have to look at their wrongs. We look at you, Jesus, now. And in our mind's eye, we see all that love you have for mankind flowing back to us. Jesus, you took my sin. You took my stink. And you gave me your purity. You took my stink and gave me your righteousness. You took my stink and gave me your holiness. Now, all I can say back to you, Jesus, is thank you for loving me that much. Thank you for caring about my soul. Thank you for giving up your life that I might have life. Now, because Jesus doesn't hold our past sin against us. Because Jesus died for us. He bids us to come to him for his warm, forgiving embrace. His death bought our forgiveness. Hallelujah. What can we render back to him? Our bodies in purity, our minds in holiness, and our souls in submission. That's all that we can render. Then we can say, thank you, Jesus, for being my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Redeemer. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to be the recipient of your love, your grace, your mercy, your sacrifice, and forgiveness on that cross. Jesus We'll never know how much it cost to see our sins upon that cross. As we think about your suffering, it makes those of us who love you weep in our hearts. And now we desire to love you with our whole hearts and give you glory and honor today and forevermore to dedicate our lives to serving you and your kingdom. Our desire is never to sin against you again. We may not wholly make it, but it is a desire. So thank you, Jesus, for putting love and forgiveness all over our sinful souls as you utter to our God from that cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because I still love each and every one of them. Amen, and God bless you. I want to briefly bring your attention to the second word, and the second word is, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise paradise. Allow me to bring your focus into this, this second uh, saying of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to be with you long, but I want to give you, I want to bring your attention on the title. I want to entitle this, uh, How to Get the Right Response from Jesus During the Resurrection Season. 
how to get the right response to Jesus during this resurrection season. Let's start with verse 39. Verse 39, it says this. It says, then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. I want to talk about how to get the right response of Jesus during this resurrection season. Listen, let's look at verse number 39. He said, the one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself from us. Now, now this is what the, the criminal is, is, is doing something wrong because he is mocking Jesus. He is mocking his identity. He is even mocking his power. But this is, this, that's, that is how you're not going to get the right response. Have you ever sometimes been praying one time and you're praying and said, God, if you have the power, can you do this? Don't be that person that goes into prayer asking God, asking God, questioning him, his, questioning his identity and questioning his power. And so the first, the first and then, then the criminal said this. This is what the second criminal said. The second criminal on the other side of Jesus said this. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Then verse 40, it says, but the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God since, since you are undergoing the same punishment? Listen, the first thing I want to touch you, the first thing I want to, the first point I want to get you at in this and how to get the proper response from Jesus during this resurrection season. First of all, you got to have a healthy fear. Somebody shout healthy fear. Somebody type healthy fear of God. See, the second criminal, the other criminal on the other side of Jesus, he had a healthy fear of God. He had a healthy fear of God. He knew that he knew that God is Almighty. He knew that God is sovereign. He didn't understand what was going on, even with Jesus. But he had a healthy fear. Do you have a healthy fear of Jesus Christ? That's a question that you want to put put that in, in, in the chat. Do you have a healthy fear? Healthy fear, especially in our culture today. The question is, do you have a healthy fear of God? Do you have a healthy fear of Christ? Do you have a healthy Healthy fear. Now, there's there's some, there's 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 this thing we call unhealthy fear. But do you have a healthy fear? The healthy fear is when you are serving God and you just have the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. That you have that healthy fear of God because you have developed a relationship. And I fear you, God, because you are Almighty. I fear you, God, because you are all worthy. That is a healthy fear. The man, the criminal, said this. He said this. He said. He said. He said this. He said, he said, don't you just have a healthy career? Don't you have a healthy fear? Ain't that, ain't, 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 why you fear? Because we deserve what has happened to us. But this man did not deserve Jesus. This Jesus, this man did not deserve what happened to him. But we deserve it. Have, don't you know, remember when I said this before? I don't know if you know it, that it's because of God's grace that we are not, all are not consumed. Amen. It's because of God's grace that we are all not consumed. Assume. And this and this thief and this this criminal, the second criminal on this side of Jesus, he was saying, listen, it's because of his grace that we are not even dead right now. It's because of his grace, his grace. The second thing to recognize is that I want you to. First of all, the second one, how to get the proper, how to get the right response from Jesus Christ during this resurrection season. The second thing is recognize that you are a sinner. Recognize that you are a sinner. Listen, listen, verse 41, it says, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. He said, this man has done nothing wrong. See, the second criminal recognized that he was a sinner. The, he recognized that he was a sinner. He recognized that he was a sinner saved by grace. Have you ever been around somebody who thought they were holier than thou? Come on, come on, come on, holier than thou. You've been around the saints who were sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, didn't do no wrong. Even when you seen them do something wrong, they said, hey, I that wasn't wrong, that's just my mistake. But they seem sometimes that they feel like they're holy, got an arrogance about themselves. They think they'll do anything wrong. But the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I want you to recognize this morning, I want you to recognize tonight, whenever you listen to it, I want you to recognize that all of us are sinners saved by grace. I want you to lift up your holy hands right now and say, thank God for saving me. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, I thank God for saving me. Aren't you glad that God has saved you? Aren't you glad that you, that you were living in sin, but God has picked you up and has saved you? The, listen, if God has to reach way down, he will pick you up. If he has to reach way down, he will, be, he will pick you up. See, the criminal recognized that, yes, I'm a sinner, but your Jesus Christ is here and I want to be saved by you. Listen, this is how I know that he knows he was getting a, he was getting a response. Remember, no, notice that Jesus didn't respond to the criminal that was mocking him, but in response to the criminal that was acknowledging these things. The first thing he acknowledged was, not only do you recognize that I have a, a healthy fear of God, Jesus got a response with that. Secondly, he recognized that he recognized that he was a sinner saved by grace. He got a response from Jesus Christ by, by that. Thirdly, and I'm done, thirdly is he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Listen, how to get a right response during this resurrection season. You, the lastly, and this is the best part of it all, you've got to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. How do you know, preacher, how do you know that this man, that this criminal accepted Jesus Christ? It's right here in the text. I'm not leaving the text. It's right here in the text. Listen to what he says. He says this. He says, then he said, Jesus Remember, <laughs> remember me when you come into your kingdom. First of all, he says, remember me. So he's recognizing Jesus as Lord. <laughs> He's wrecking. He's making that confession right now. He's making that confession. He said, you argue, would you remember me when in your kingdom? Would you remember me? He's, he's recognizing that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then he says, he says this, he says, Jesus, remember when you come into your kingdom and, and Jesus said to him, listen, he said, truly, I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. Listen, the best thing I said this whole mini sermon is that the last response that you need to get during this, if you want Jesus to respond, if you want to get the, you want him to respond during this resurrection, this resurrection season, I want you to accept him as a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to introduce, I want to introduce you today to a man that I know that can save you, to a man that I know that can deliver you, to a man that I know that could heal you, to a man that I know that when you down, when you're down and out, he will pick you up, to a man that I know that he will wipe all your tears from your eyes, to a man that I know, and his name is Jesus Christ. Do I have any witness up in here? Do I have any witness up in here that can testify? Don't let me testify by myself. Won't you put your praise emo emojis right there on that, on that feed and say, Lord, I thank you for saving me when I think about the goodness of Jesus. And all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Do I have any witness in here? Do I have any witness here that he will pick you up? 
He will turn you around uh, and he'll place your feet uh, on a solid ground. I want to introduce you to Jesus. If you want to get a proper response, won't you accept him in your life? Won't you accept him into your heart? Won't you accept him into your life? Won't you accept him right now? I thank you, God. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How to get the proper response during this resurrection, response from Jesus during this resurrection season. First of all, you got to have a healthy fear. You have to have a healthy fear. Come to Christ. Come to God with a healthy fear. With a healthy fear. Secondly, you must recognize that you are a sinner. Listen. Listen, I don't, want, I don't want no one to even think this arrogance. All have sinned, even I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, the preacher, I have fallen short and sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I need a savior. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. We all need him. Listen, and the third thing is this. Is this is that to get God to get Jesus a proper response during this resurrection, during this resurrection, during this resurrection um, season? Won't you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just like this criminal did, just like he did? He said, "Remember me in your kingdom. Remember me in your kingdom." And Jesus said, "Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me." in paradise, the word of God for the people of God. Why does Jesus address his mother as woman? Go with me, if you will, to the scene of the cross where we find Jesus nailed to the cross. Even now in the midst of his own suffering and pain, Jesus is concerned about someone other than himself. And he looks down from the cross, connects with a woman, and interrupts death to make the following announcement. What is this announcement? It is simply this, woman, here is your son. Who is this woman that Jesus is so concerned about? It's Mary, his mother. But why does he address her as woman? Is he being rude and disrespectful to his mother? In the English translation, it might sound disrespectful, but in the original Greek language, it is a highly respectful and affectionate mode of address. In fact, in some translations, it may say, dear woman. Some scholars equate it with ma'am, or lady. Whatever the case is, we all can rest assured that Jesus was not being disrespectful to his mother. The real point here is this. As his mother watches him suffer, he knows how she must be suffering also. As I read this, I wondered if Mary was thinking back on the prophecy spoken to her after Jesus was born and a sword will pierce your very soul. Her soul was painfully pierced as she watched her son hanging there. Jesus could not point to Mary because his hands were nailed to the cross. So he must have made eye contact with her when he said, woman, here is your son. Here we see Jesus as the perfect model of obedience. Obedience to his heavenly father as unto death and obedient to his earthly father and mother, which is also evident here at the cross. Joseph, his earthly father, is no longer alive. So it is his responsibility as the eldest son to care for his widowed mother. The fifth commandment also addresses children, which says, honor your father and your mother. So why does Jesus commit his mother to John and not to his own brothers? After addressing his mother, Jesus then turned to the disciple whom he loved and said, here 
is your mother. Jesus wanted to make sure his mother would be taken care of after he left the earth. It's as if Jesus is saying, my time on earth is short. My mission is just about complete. And before I go, I want to make sure you are in good hands. Before I go, I want you to know that someone I trust will be there for you. Before I go, I want you to know you will have a safe, stable place to lay your head. Not just a house, but a home where there will be love. Before I go, I want you to know that when you get hungry, you will be fed. When you get lonely, you will be loved. When you get sad, you will be comforted. When the wolves try to attack you, you will be protected. And when you want to talk about my father or discuss things about me, you can freely do that with John because like you, he believes in me. Now we know that John 5 says that his brothers did not believe in him at this time. Jesus was saying to his mother, don't worry because the disciple whom I love will be there for and he will be there with you. In the midst of his mother's hurt, Jesus offered her hope. So what are some of the lessons that we can learn from this text? Lesson number one, children of all ages are to honor their father and mother. There is no expiration date on the responsibility to our parents. Just as Jesus made provisions for his mother is an example for us to do likewise to our parents. We too need to get our house in order by making sure that those we leave behind have proper provisions. Lesson number three, what is the lesson to us as a church, as a body of believers? We need not ask that age old question that used to be on that cute little bracelet, WWJD, what would Jesus do? The real question is, WWWD, what would we do? So in closing, let us remember the words recorded in Luke 8, 19 through 21. My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. The word of God spoke from that old rugged cross that day. And verse 27 of our text reads, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's think about how good God has been to us. This is a song of love we like to sing. It says, I really love you. I really love you Because you first loved me I really love you, yes I do I really love you I really love you Because you first loved me Come on, help me say it. I really love you. Come on, say it. I really love you. I really love you. Because you first. Because you first love me. Say it again, I really love, I really love you. Sounds good, Mount Carmel said. I really love you. Because you first loved me. Because you first loved me. Glory to his name. I really love, I really love you. Yes, I do. I like this next part. How can you love me knowing all? showed me when you gave your only son I really love you yeah I really love you yes I do come on how could you love
love me, said, How can you love me? Knowing all, knowing all the things I've done. And then you show me. And then you show me. When you gave me your only son, I really love you. Uh, I really love you. Come on, let's take it back to the top. I really love you. I really love you. Come on, sing it from your heart. I really love you. I really love you. Make it personal. Because you first love me. Because you first love me. Come on. I really love, I really love you. Yes, I do. I really love you. I really, really, really love you. I really love you. Come on. Because you first love me. Because you first love me. Come on, saints, come on and testify. I really love you, yes I do. Come on, say it. How can you love me? How can you love me? Knowing all, knowing all the things I've done. And then you show and me, then you show me when you gave, when you gave your only son. I really love you. Yes, I really love you. I really love you. The song I sing. You are the song I sing. No one can compare. No one can compare to all the joy. To all the joy you bring. You bring. You bring. Oh, oh, oh yes I love. Oh yes I love. With all my heart. With all my heart. Oh yes I love. Oh yes I love. With all my soul. With all my Come soul. On. Because you first of me. Testify in this place. I really love you. Yes, I do. Oh, yes, I love you. Oh, yes, I love With all my heart. With all my heart. Oh, yes, I love Oh, yes, I love With all my soul. With all my soul. Because you first of me. Come on. I really love I really love you. Yes, this feels good. Come on. Because you're first. Oh yes, I love him. Hey, with all my heart. Oh yes, I love. Oh yes, I love him. With all my soul. With all my soul, because you first of me. Come on, put your hands on it. I really love, I really love you. Yes Come on, I want to hear you. Come on. Because you first of me. Yes. I really love, I love you. Yes, I do. Because you first of me. Say it one more time. Because you first, because you first love me. Come on, all together. I really love you. Yes, I do. Hallelujah. And bless his name. Put those hands together and bless him. Hallelujah. Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabatani. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? These words found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 15 and verse 34 were spoken by our Lord in his fourth utterance from the cross of Calvary. Let's pray. Father, be pleased to glorify thy name through these words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The question, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Is a question for the ages and one that must be answered. I want to answer that question today in your hearing. Our Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken 
because of sin. About 50 years ago in 1973, a psychiatrist by the name of Carl Menninger wrote a bestseller titled, Whatever Became of Sin? He writes, we now view many behaviors that the Bible calls sin as psychological or emotional issues for which therapy and not repentance is the solution. He goes on to say, sin has become a disease that we treat therapeutically, not a behavior for which we are responsible. Beloved, God demands that we acknowledge our sin. Repent of our sins and turn to him for refuge. He demands that we be holy. Be holy, for I am holy, 1 Peter 1.16. Ah, oh, but thanks be to God. That holiness that God demands, his grace provides in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He who knew no sin, our Lord Jesus, was made sin so that in him, you and I could be made righteous in Christ. We're told in 1 John 2, 2, that Jesus is the propitiation. That's just a big word for the substitute. He was the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Because God is infinitely holy. He hates and abhors sin. His loathing of sin, uh, listen, is solemnly displayed at the cross of Calvary. We celebrate it every year. Where he punished sin. Quote. To its utmost, even when it is imputed to his own son, he hates it. My friend, your sin and mine is why Christ died. You see, beloved, the wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die. But the free gift of God. It's eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord was forsaken so that you and I would not be forsaken. That's the gospel. My friends, I understand why the hymn writer said these words. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. God bless you this morning and happy Resurrection Sunday. And protocol has already been established, so I'm going to go right on into the text that's found in John, the 19th chapter, the 28th verse. And it reads, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. 
three words, simple words, familiar words that we've all spoken, but perhaps drastic, fatal words and even paradoxical words when they're being uttered by Jesus, the one who ushers in the living water that will never, ever run dry. How can this be? How is this possible? The word of God is flooded with images of God, the son using water as an example of his divinity. The scriptures are soaked and saturated with examples upon examples of God as water, the source of our eternal life. We don't even have to leave the book of John to find a plethora of examples. For instance, just 16 chapters earlier from this iconic text in John 19, we find Jesus in the midst of a salvific conversation with one of the rulers of the Jews named Nicodemus. Nick, for short, came to Jesus inconspicuously at night asking, how can an old man enter into his mother's womb a second time. In other words, how can I be born again? And Jesus says to him, watch this, unless one is born with water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But it's, perplex it's perplexing when we hear Jesus, the one who in chapter four of John tells the Samaritan woman at the well, he has the living water and that whoever drinks of this water he gives will never thirst. It could be a little nuance now when we hear Ju Jesus saying, I am thirsty as he hangs on the cross. In fact, many theologians would call this paradoxical. You see, a, a biblical paradox is a seemingly contradictory statement that is still absolutely true. It is true that Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding of Canaan in John chapter 2, giving us a glimpse of his glory, giving us a glimpse of his Godhead. Well... If he could turn water into wine at a wedding in Canaan, then surely he ought to be able to turn bitter wine into water at the cross at Calvary to quench his own thirst. Because he was thirsty. Make no doubt about it. He, he was thirsty. Yes, he, he was thirsty. He was physically thirsty. He was physically dehydrated. After sitting in a, a kangaroo court with Pontius Pilate who charged him falsely of treason and sentenced him to death by crucifixion. And then the shame and pain of being forced to walk the Via Della Rosa where he was mocked and, and scorned and whipped and, and torn all while carrying a 165 pound beam on his skin torn back. Yeah, this displayed his humanity. This, this displayed his true hum humanity in no uncertain terms. He, he felt the moment of dehydration because he was extremely thirsty, clearly fulfilling the words written a thousand years earlier, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, according to Psalms 22 and 15. You see, I thirst. God does not thirst. Angels do not thirst. We shall not thirst in glory, according to Revelation 7 and 16, but we thirst now. Because we are human and we are living in a sin-sick world. We're, we're living in a world full of sorrow. And Christ thirsted because he was a man. And as a man, he entered fully into the hour of suffering. Even the suffering of a thirst often associated with those mortally wounded. 
You do know he was wounded for our transgression. But, but I ain't going there just yet. I ain't going there just yet. But he was also thirsting spiritually. See, his thirst was real, but it was not just physical. See, we need to remember that Jesus was on the cross as a substitute for sinners and therefore was going through an experience vicariously of a sinner alienated from God and receiving God's ultimate judgment. But not only was Jesus committed to God's program, he, he, was, he was committed to the program. The Bible said he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And even when everything was screaming against him, suffering, rejection, forsaken, all that has been happening these last few hours doesn't undermine, but underlines the reality that he was thirsty. And he knew that by uttering these three simple words, now the chain of events that fulfilled Psalms 69 and 21 would take place. And they did, bearing the agony the suffering, and now the wrath of God's judgment. He did not lose his understanding of who he is and what he was accomplishing through it, but he confirmed it. Look at the text one last time in John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said... I am thirsty. This was not just some natural cry of distress, but I am thirsty was an identity cry. I am thirsty was a supernatural announcement. I am thirsty, arguably the most profound words Jesus has ever uttered. I am thirsty. That was his identity cry. I am thirsty. I am thirsty. What he was really saying is, according to the text, I am fulfilling prophecy. I am fulfilling the book. I am who the book says I am. I am that great I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl can come to the Father but by me. You see, because I, I paid a hell of a price. I made the ultimate sacrifice. I was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all to the glory of the Father. I thirst to fulfill the book. I thirsted for all your sins I took. I thirsted. Yes, this is true. I thirsted so you no longer have to. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now, Lord, move Deborah and use this vessel for your word this day. In Jesus' name, Amen. Church, there is power in the name of Jesus. The sixth word, John 19, 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As parents, we often give our children a task to do 
And when uh, that task is over or completed, they return to us and let us know that it's finished or it is done. So is the case with Jesus. Jesus was sent by his father to complete a task here on earth. When he came to this world, he told us what his assignment was. In Luke 19.10, he said it was to provide salvation to a lost and broken world. So his last words, Jesus was communicating that the work he came to do was accomplished. The task of earning salvation of the world was completed in his work on the cross. No more additions, no more adjustments were necessary. Salvation was completed. The debt was paid in full. Let me pause here to give you a brief lesson in Bible study history. To tell us die, T-E-T-E-L-E-S-T-A, to tell us die. To tell us die is a Greek word that means it is finished in the English language. It only is found twice in the New Testament. John 19, 28, you will find it is finished. John 19, 30, you will find it is finished. During New Testament times, when an employee had completed a day's work or finished a project, he would tell his boss to tell us die. This was a signal that whatever it was that was assigned he or she to do was now completed, to telestai. Maybe the most common use of to telestai during Jesus' day was a debt collecting. When a person finally paid off a loan, they were issued a receipt that was stamped with the word to telestai, which meant that their debt was now paid in full. This was the verification that they were no longer responsible for any of that debt, that everything they owed was completely and permanently paid for. Now, the Bible says, our sin created a debt to God. Our sin created a debt to God. And one that we could never pay back on our own. But when Jesus died, when Jesus died, he was paying off our debt of sin once and for all. The book of Hebrews 10, 12 through 13 and 18 says, but he having offered one sacrifice of sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God the Father, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer an offering for sin. All of these nuances of tetelestai converge together in communicating a beautiful truth, a truth that Jesus completed the work of salvation once and for all. That means it's not up to us to add anything. It's not up to us to complete anything. It is not up to us to finalize anything when it comes to salvation. Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. So now, when we put our trust in the finished work of Jesus, we can rest and be assured in his confidence of our salvation and pursue God with our whole hearts. My sisters and my brothers, accept God's payment for your redemption. Make Jesus your choice. He is calling you to trust him with your future and your life now and in eternity. Remember, our redemption was paid with his blood. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, declare a new season. Confess with your mouth. 
Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. For it is with your mouth, your mouth, that you confess and are saved. It is finished to tell us die. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Father, I pray right now that you'll turn these lips of clay into your mouthpiece, that your word will go forth, that it will penetrate even the hearts of those who hear this word. And we will be sure to give you all glory and honor and praise for you alone are worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, it is an honor, it's a privilege to share with you, along with my fellow brothers and sisters in the ministry here at Mount Carmel as part of the last seven words service. Dr. Hendricks, Elder Harvin, Reverend Lee, Dr. Newby, Pastor Weaver, Minister Blakeney, all have shared very beautifully. I have been given the assignment to share the seventh and the final word or statement of Jesus as recorded in the book of Luke. Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. I would contend to you today that there is a uniqueness about Luke's writing. In fact, all of the four synoptic gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each have a certain, sometimes subtle, but uniqueness to the recording of the events of the gospel. Each of them record in a kind of a unique way. Uh, I would say that this is not strange, nor is it mysterious. Although the tenets of our faith are all the same, you know, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. It is our individual lives that, in our individual experiences, that allow us to have a personal and unique relationship with God through his son Jesus. This is ultimately, this ultimately affects our perspective on religion. It, it ultimately affects our perspective on Jesus and on God himself. So, so with that, you may not understand why I praise the way I praise. You may not understand why I have to shout when I shout. You may not understand how sometimes I just got to stand up and cross my arms and rock. You may not understand why I got to cry sometimes. You may not understand because you haven't been through what I've been through. You don't know what I've been through, and I don't know what you've been through. So I can't say anything about the way you praise. But it's that uniqueness. It's that, that life experiences that gives me a perspective of my God that is different from everybody else's. So here we have Luke. We have Luke, the physician, the doctor by trade. To at times he seems like he is, he has this desire to connect the human attributes of God to our human physical attributes. He, he somehow has this desire to connect so that we understand that, that Jesus is the word wrapped in flesh and came and dwelt among. He wants to make a connection so that we can see ourselves in the person of Jesus. And so we connect with that. And, and Luke does this even early on. And I think about Luke chapter 2, and, and, and we know that Luke is the only gospel writer that records the circumcision of Jesus. Even though that was a Jewish custom, and we know how important it would have been also to Matthew, Mark, and John. It is Luke who records the physical on the eighth day circumcision. It's Luke 
It's Luke, even as we are looking, as we are approaching these last days of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all record this same interaction, this same thing in the garden, but it is Luke who writes it in a way that we would understand and get the details of the physical suffering of Jesus. And I think that's because he's a doctor. Look at what he, look what he wrote in Luke 22, verse, verse 44. He says, in his anguish, in his agony, he prayed more earnestly and sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. That sounds like the language of a physician. That sounds like Luke was writing in Jesus's my chart, that his, his sweat, his anguish, his stress, knowing what was coming. And he said, let this cup pass from me. And it stressed him so that his sweat turned to drops of blood. We know that this is a physical condition called hemohytodrosis. It is a physical condition, but here is Luke, a doctor, giving us the physical so that we can understand how this man named Jesus had his flesh tore, how he was speared in his side, all of the physical agony that he went through. So when I look at these last words, and the Bible records, Luke says that from the sixth to the ninth hour, the sun refused to shine. The veil was torn in half. And Jesus cried out these words, Father, oh Lord, I can stop right there. That's a reason to shout right there by itself. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when I read this and I meditated on this word, my, my attention and my spirit took me to that word hands. And when I thought about the hands, I thought about my own father's hands. If you've been blessed to have a father like I did, I can remember as a boy, my father's hands were the strongest thing I knew. My father seems as though he had so much strength in his hands. It was those hands of my father that he worked 38 years in a factory building auto parts. It was my father's hands that provided for our family. It was my father's hands that provided protection for our family. It was my father's hands that told the story of being born in Greenwood, Mississippi, going and being in the army, coming home, being rejected, and now finds himself working in a factory to supply a living for his family. My father's hands. My father's hands were strong. It was those same hands that when I needed a pat on my back, my father's hands would pat me on the back. It's those same hands that when I needed discipline, those hands would hit me somewhere else. It was my father's hands. See, mama would get a switch, but daddy didn't need a switch. He just had his hands. And when I think about the strength of my daddy's hands, and here we have Jesus on the cross saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. <laughs> And I think it's symbolic because it was Jesus had been God's hands on earth. It was Jesus' hands that opened the eyes of the blind. If you don't believe me, go by a blind man that was at Bethesda. It was Jesus' hands that healed the lame and the crippled. If you don't believe me, think about the woman who had infirmity, who was bent over for 18 years. It was Jesus' hands that broke the bread of five barley loaves and two fish and fed the multitude. It was Jesus' hands, even as we talk about the Garden of Gethsemane. When Peter sliced off the ear of the soldier, it was Jesus' hands that picked it up and placed it back and healed it. So what does this all mean to us today? I'm reminded of the great gospel classic. You ought to hold onto God's 
unchanging hand. God's unchanging hand. Fill your hope with things eternal. God's unchanging hand. So I'm here to tell you, my brother and my sister, if you're dealing with stress, hang on to God's unchanging hand. If your finances are not working out, hold on to God's unchanging hand. If you got a diagnosis that you don't like, hang on to God's unchanging hand. If things aren't going well, if you're stressed and depressed, get help, but hang on to God's unchanging hand. When everything is breaking loose in your life, hang on to God's unchanging hand. So my brother and sister, if you do not know Christ for your personal savior, seek the hand of God. Hang on to God's unchanging hand. And I promise you, if you hang on to God's unchanging hand, he will see you through and you will be blessed. And you look back and say, I'm so glad that God never left me or forsaken me. That's my message for you today. Hang on to God's unchanging hand. God bless you.